Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. On the Sunshine Coast near Gibson's British Columbia, I was a resident leader at a YMCA camp at Langdale, about 20 kilometers north. My assistant, myself, and nine boys aged 10 and 11 left for an overnight hike up to Tetrahyden Ridge. Tet Ridge had been abandoned by Mac Blow Logging a few years before and was awaiting reforestation. Consequently, the area had many large 5 to 10 hectare clear cuts, which, after leaving the logging road, we began to hike through. During these traverses, we, the assistant and I, began to get brief glimpses of a large black figure disappearing into the thick brush, either ahead of us or just off to the side, left or right. It looked approximately 8 to 10 feet tall, although it was almost always uphill from us. As it was quite off in the distance, we could never be sure if it was real or just our imagination playing tricks on us. Fifteen-year-old boys have large imaginations, especially growing up hearing stories of Bigfoot. It wasn't until we began to see incredible large tracks and broken branches at the eight or nine foot level that we became worried. After at least five sightings during our afternoon hike, we started to contemplate returning to camp. We soon realized that we had hiked further than our turnaround mark and would have to stay the night somewhere. We also became concerned that the management of the camp would not look favorably on us returning early with such a tall tale, scaring the kids needlessly and so on. So we made camp almost at the summit of Tet Ridge and would finish the ascent in the morning. Dinner and the sing-song that followed were uneventful. The only tense moments came when the campers or us had to use the latrine we had constructed away from the camp and the large bonfire. We, the assistant and I, watched the campers like hawks and, after the last moor had been eaten, sent our charges to bed. We stayed up to clean and stow the food properly in a tree. We banked the campfire and began to enter our tent when the first of many roars, about five to ten, echoed off the surrounding mountainside. It was unlike anything I have ever heard before or since, and the power behind them was disturbing. The sound seemed to be generated effortlessly. We had to reassure the boys many times and slept by the campfire, sitting back to back, debating the risk to hiking down in the dark. Finally, the sound stopped, and although we thought we heard something in the bush, about 200 meters below us, the rest of the longest night I have ever experienced finally came to an end. We broke camp after breakfast and completed our trek. Although we looked for tracks and any other signs during our hike back to camp, we did not see anything. We agreed not to tell anyone of this and began convincing the boys that they did not hear anything more than the howl of the wind, which most of them accepted dubiously. I hope this helps, and although I am glad to tell someone my story, I would not wish to repeat this experience. I have since camped on the Sunshine Coast with my family, and, as my wife can attest, do not sleep very well. I will never forget what I heard.
On to the next one. Two Bigfoot were seen at night crouching under a tree between Prince Rupert and Kamloops in British Columbia. A third Bigfoot was standing nearby that appeared 11 to 12 feet tall and possibly weighing 800 to 1,000 pounds. On to the next one. On the west side of Dilworth Mountain, overlooking the golf course cemetery where the safety fence is now standing near Kelowna, I was out for a hike with my dog. We would go out for a few hours at a time, hoping to rid her of the excess energy. Dobermans can be fairly high strung. Usually, it was in the local hills of Kelowna. The spot we were hiking is called Dilworth Mountain, which is now full of housing development, but at the time had very little. It was about March, and there was still a fair amount of snow on the ground, but it was melting rapidly from mild temperatures and occasional rain. My dog's nose was pretty keen to various deer or other critters you'd see while out. She'd often catch wind of a deer and start tracking before I saw it. After a few hours out, we were coming back along the outside ridge, which gave a pretty decent view of town. It was around 5 p.m. and a gray day. It was on the verge of getting dark. Toward the end of our hike, I came across footprints in the snow. I stopped and looked at them and had a good laugh, thinking some kids had gotten creative with plywood cutouts. As I looked closer, I could see that these were not made from flat cutout. You could see the shape of the foot that left them. I placed my hiking boot, which were a size 10 beside one. The print dwarfed my boot. Another thing that I found strange was that there were two sets of prints, a large one as well as a smaller set. I thought that was kind of odd. If kids were doing a practical joke, why make a smaller set? My dog's reaction really was what set me through. She picked up a scent from the prints and immediately followed them with her nose to them. I never saw her react that way from people's tracks, only from animals and usually deer. She had run into the trees following the tracks in a matter of seconds. Her reaction really creeped me out because suddenly this seemed real. I whistled and called her back, wanting to leave pronto. When I returned to take photos the next day, I couldn't find the track. Between the rain and me trying to find the exact spot, well, I just couldn't find them. I found it odd that these tracks would be so close to town as well. On to the next one. in the Fraser River Valley in British Columbia. One summer, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was sleeping out in the field behind my house with my brother and her friend, just out on a tarp to watch the stars. We were within 20 feet of the woods. I woke up early in the morning and watched a Sasquatch walk past us, right along the edge of the woods. I made eye contact and... It stared right back at me as it strutted along. It didn't seem to have much of a neck, though, although its head swiveled to keep eye contact. I remember the stare as being very intense, although not really threatening. It is very unnerving to remember that stare now. It was intelligent. Animals do not hold your gaze the way that creature held mine. It seemed very big although I couldn't say just how tall. I was quite young and lying down at that, so my perspective was a bit strange. It seemed to cover ground quickly, though it was just walking. Its arms were swinging. The hair on its head seemed a bit shaggy. It was quite dark, blackish colored. I think it must have been a male. It gave the impression of being very physically fit. I don't remember it making a sound or that it smelled like anything. It certainly didn't give the impression of being frightened by us. It was early morning, but quite light out. 
maybe 5.30 or 6 a.m. The month would have been July or August. It couldn't have been too late as I went back to sleep afterward. It was maybe a hundred meters above the level of the valley floor on a bench or plateau of land along the base of the Douglas Mountain Range, the Coast Mountain. There are hobby farms in the area. The woods behind my house are second growth, but with very large trees and fairly dense undergrowth. On to the next one. Near Revelstoke in British Columbia, I was driving my pickup truck on the Trans-Canada Highway on my way to Kelowna, B.C. I was alone at the time. I had a friend a half hour in front of me and some friends 15 minutes behind me. I saw this very large man-like animal crossing the road about three to 400 feet in front of me. It came up the side of the ditch and almost looked like it looked to make sure there were no cars coming. It looked right at me and then crossed the road and went down the other side of the ditch. It was eight to nine feet tall with very big shoulders, long arms, and it had orangey brown hair. It had to have been seven to nine hundred pounds, if not more. It crossed the road with big, long strides. I looked in the bush where it had went. I was going to wave some people down, but it was moving way too fast, and there were just too many trees. It was gone. It occurred about 6.30 to 7 a.m. on a nice summer morning in a pine forest with thick brush. My father's friend was a firefighter and spotted one some 30 years ago from his chopper. On to the next one. On the Sunshine Coast, 30 miles northwest of Vancouver, the town's name is Gibson's Landing. My friend and I had been hiking up the mountain trail on Cemetery Road. The time was about 11 a.m. There were low clouds that day. We hiked up and down this trail many times. On the way up that day, we observed a black-colored animal. As we walked up to the spot where we saw the back of the animal touch a branch of a tree, we discovered it must have been nine to ten feet tall. We didn't get a good look at the creature, but could smell a wet, dog-like smell. We saw a trail that the animal had made, so we walked through it and came out under some cedars. We noted huckleberry leaves on the ground made into a bed. Whatever made this, we knew it was not from any man or bear. On to the next one. In Lumbee in British Columbia. It was a late summer night. I was 16 at the time. My friend and I were at my parents' house in Lumbee. It backs onto a creek and borders a huge tract of wilderness. You could walk for 60 miles straight and not see a human habitation. It was twilight. We were the only people home. It was late summer and still warm out. So we were outside on the deck by the pool. My friend had a knee injury and was in a cast. We were just getting ready to go inside when we both heard a scream that sounded like a human yelling, but an animalistic growling scream quality to it coming from behind the house. It was a long, drawn-out scream. It wasn't too close, but it was very distinguishable, maybe a half kilometer away. We turned to each other and he asked, did you hear that? I was just going to ask him the same question, but wasn't sure that I had really heard it. We were both really spooked and scrambled to get inside the house. He was having trouble because his leg was in a full leg cast, so I had to go back to help him. We locked all the doors, and I grabbed the shotgun and some shells. I went out onto the back porch a couple of times and could hear something moving in the distance, but I didn't see or hear anything else. We stayed up nearly all night. That's how strange it was. A while ago, I was watching Mysterious Encounters, 
and I heard a recording of a Sasquatch call taken by some men in a hunting camp. When I heard that, my hair stood on end. It was the exact same howling noise I heard back then. I have often felt like I'm being watched when I go past a certain point up the creek behind my parents' place. I have another story to relate that my brother told me. He was up at a piece of property he bought, which is only a couple of kilometers away from my parents' house. He was up there cleaning out a shed when he heard what sounded like a person banging two rocks together. There is an old rock quarry up above his house that hasn't been used for years, and that's where the sound was coming from. It continued on and off for the few hours he was up there, sometimes closer, sometimes further away. He said it was a slow, steady tapping, not like someone tapping a hammer on a rock like tap, tap, tap. A few days later, he asked his only neighbor up there if he was making the noise, but he said he was away for the day. There are no other people up there, and he looked into the quarry on his way home, but didn't see anyone or anything or any tire track. There is also a place called Bear Valley where I always feel like I'm being watched. From the moment I arrive to the moment I leave. Weird. The rock tapping is not unique. Rock tapping is a feature of many Bigfoot reports. On to the next one. I saw a creature in Brookfield, Massachusetts. It was while we were heading home from a bird hunting trip in the fall of 2011. It was around mid-October. I was tagging along with my in-laws and their friends and their hunting dog. I was taking photos of the dog and its activities. I smelt like a skunk or wet animal smell about 50 yards away from where I saw the creature. Then, when I saw the creature, it was walking away from us. It seemed as if the creature was avoiding eye contact with us and more like it was just scooting away from us. I said to the in-laws and their friend, look at that guy in the monkey suit walking in the woods alone. And they all looked at the creature. At this same time, I didn't want them to shoot at the creature with their guns, so I said, darn kid, skipping school and dressing like a monkey, what is he thinking? And I started to walk away. Next thing I thought was that I should take a photo of this creature, and I turned around, but it was already gone and nowhere to be found. I heard no sound or swift movements of the creature. The creature was very tall, yet skinny, the body about 180 pounds and about 7 feet tall. It had pitch black, smooth, shiny hair. I should have taken a photo of this pitch black smooth shiny haired creature walking away from us in the beginning. On to the next one. In Bell County in Kentucky, June and her husband Scott went to get corn out of their garden. Once they got there, six rows of corn was uprooted and the corn all ate. June said, it was in about seven or eight piles after it was eaten off the clean cobs. Our squash and pumpkins got gone too. Our garden looked like a tornado had been through it. This all happened in one night, and the eaten corn cobs were left in neat little piles. According to June, there were several tracks. The size of the tracks was wider and larger than her son's shoe, and he wears a size 13. It was about three inches longer than her son's shoes, and it had five toes, so that would make this track around 16 inches. June also said that they also heard strange, loud yells off in the distance several times. Others from the area have also confirmed hearing these yells. Of course, people always point at things like this as being a bear, but in my opinion, there is just no way. I mean, a bear eating corn and stacking up the cobs in a neat pile? 
The story is also backed up by multiple witnesses to the strange yelling sound. On to the next one. My family was working in the garden. My dad had plowed between potatoes, and then we were planting other stuff like corn and beans up above the row where a big footprint was found. We got done planting and had to build a fence with yarn and garbage bags to keep the deer out. My dad left to work in hay, and my mom and me went to get more bags at her house. And my sister and my husband and the kids went to my house to get water to drink. When we got back, my six-year-old ran to the end of the garden to beat us all there. He started screaming that he found a Bigfoot print. We thought he was joking or just mistaken until we got out there and saw it. He had bent down and knocked some dirt into it, but not much at all. I couldn't believe it. I saw it, but I was really searching my brain for what else it could be. We looked around and found four or five in all, but this was the best one. I measured one and it was 15 inches long. The others were in places we had been working all day, but this one was in the row plowed that no one went back into. There is no way this was a person. The only way in or out is to pass my house and my sister and her husband would have seen someone go in. We were only gone for 20 or 30 minutes at most. I have no other explanation for it. Believe me, I have racked my brain. I don't even think I truly believed it until about 7 p.m. that evening when I got online. Then I pretty much knew what it had to be. People say it's faked. I really like to hear that because that means we found a good print. I'm not going to swear that I know 100% that it's a Bigfoot print, but I'm 100% positive that it's not faked or made by my family in the garden that day. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below where you'll find the email ststorysubmissions at gmail.com where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!